Hello there. Today I would like to talk about the Laurentians, the St. Lawrence Iroquois. I'd like to use them to demonstrate a point about history, namely the difficulty in knowing anything. I'm going to begin by giving you the history of the Laurentians. There's not a lot of it, so I should be able to give you pretty much all of it. In the mid-1500s, a French explorer by the name of Jacques Cartier sailed across the Atlantic and up the St. Lawrence. At the time, he and his men were sick as dogs, dying of scurvy. He encountered some people along the St. Lawrence. They gave him medicine, which cured his scurvy. Cartier had some interactions, and then after a little while, he and his men decided, okay, this place is boring, let's go home. And so they kidnapped ten of the locals, dragged him off to France where they promptly died. Now, one of the things Cartier did while he was over here is he recorded a number of words from the people he met so that future generations of Frenchmen, if they ever decided to come back across the Atlantic, they'd have a leg up. Wouldn't have to start from square one in learning a language. Half a century later, when Samuel de Champlain sailed across the Atlantic and up the St. Lawrence, he went to the spots that Cartier had mentioned. He went to the villages Cartier had described, and he found no village there. Right? All he found was ruins. The site had been abandoned for many decades. So he sailed a little bit further up the St. Lawrence, and he encountered the Hurons. And he tried out some of the words that Cartier had recorded. And some of them worked, and some of them didn't. Now, that is the story of the St. Lawrence Iroquoians. That is their entire history. Now, archaeologists went and did some digging around the St. Lawrence, and they found that there were indeed people here. Surprise, surprise. And they found that their pottery is similar to Huron pottery and similar to Mohawk pottery, but slightly different from each. And their modes of subsistence were inconsistent throughout the territory, right? People in one part relied more on farming and people in another part relied more on fishing, this, that, and the other thing. And modern linguists have taken those words that Cartier recorded and have compared them against the Huron language, as well as the Mohawk language, the Oneida language, etc. And they found that some of the words match with Huron words, some of them match with Mohawk words, some of them don't match with either. From all of this, the general sort of consensus is that the St. Lawrence Iroquoians were an Iroquoian-speaking people, that is, part of the same language family, and yet distinct from either Huron or Iroquois. There are a number of theories as to where they went. So one of the theories is that they were killed by the Mohawks. This is a lazy cop-out theory. Right? It's You've all heard the history memes, oh, we found some artifact we don't understand. Probably had ceremonial purposes, right? Or here's an unexplained injury. Well, it was probably caused by falling off a horse, right? Oh, here's the people who vanished. Well, they were probably killed by the Mohawks. Now, it could be true. It could be true that the Laurentians were killed by the Mohawks. It could be true that that spoon was actually a, for ceremonial purposes. And it could be true that that broken toe was caused by a fall from a horse, but we don't really have any evidence for it. It's, it's essentially just a guess. Now, another theory is that they all died of smallpox that Cartier gave them. Now, this is an incomplete theory because we know from how it affected other people that smallpox tended to kill about two-thirds. When the Hurons, they had their first wave of smallpox, the Jesuits recorded that they lost about 50% of their population. So maybe that happened to the Laurentians, but it wouldn't have killed all of them. So then the idea is maybe some of them died from smallpox and then the rest of them decided to join with somebody larger, join with the Hurons, join with the Mohawks for protection. However, one would think that rather than joining with potential enemies, to me, it would make more sense for the uh, ravaged population of uh, Hochelaga to join together with the ravaged population of Stadacona rather than going all the way down into Mohawk territory or all the way up into Huron territory, right? Join together with the people who are part of your group. Another theory which I find much more convincing is something of a hybrid. So Cartier gave them smallpox or some such. They suffered a major population loss due to disease. And then, for protection, decided to ally with either Mohawk or Huron in that centuries-old blood feud. Now, being drawn into the war and being placed in the middle ground, 
So being situated along the St. Lawrence, they were vulnerable. So they moved back into the territory of their allies and gradually got absorbed. That's an interesting theory, and it's much more complete and compelling than the other two. But that's just a hypothesis. There isn't really evidence to support it. Now, there's another theory that maybe the St. Lawrence Iroquoians didn't exist as we understand them to exist. Maybe, rather than being a group in and of themselves, maybe the St. Lawrence Iroquoians were just another group of an already known Iroquoian people, right? Maybe they were Hurons, maybe they were Mohawks, maybe they were Oneidas, who knows? The reason this is a possibility is because the evidence, any evidence of them is so poor. So we take the linguistic evidence, right? The words that Cartier wrote down, they don't fit perfectly into either Mohawk or Huron. They don't fit perfectly. Some of the words fit, but some of them don't. Now, is this because they were two separate but related languages? Maybe. It could also be because Cartier misheard them. Right? If I, I put you in front of a, a Spanish radio program, right, and I ask you to write down as many words as you can identify, how many of them do you think you're going to get right? Are you going to get all of them right? I don't know. So it could be that Cartier misheard them, and that's why they don't fit. It could also be that Cartier wrote them down wrong. As far as I know, Cartier wasn't a linguist, so would he necessarily have used some standardized system to write down the words? Did such a system exist at the time? Right Now, if I was writing down a foreign language, I would just spell it out phonetically, one syllable at a time. But even then, there's room for error. In Mohawk, there are certain sounds which do not appear in English. So I'll give you a childish example, all right? Duckwood, foot lips. Got duckwood on your foot lips. Now, how do you write that word? You could write it B-U-T, but that's not what, that's but. Right? You could write it B-O-O-T, right? But that's boot. You could write it B-O-T, bot. You could write it with a W, but then it's what, right? Not but. Right? There's a little bit of a W sound, but not much of a W sound. Now, I would write it B apostrophe W-U-T, but then it's B what? 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 Right? It's still not right. Maybe Cartier just wrote it down wrong, the words that don't fit. Maybe he wrote them down wrong. There's a third option. Maybe Champlain read them wrong. I'm not going to deride the modern linguists. They're, they're probably got it right. They probably know better than me. But maybe Champlain read them wrong. Right? If I, I put my name up on screen, that's my Mohawk name, right? I ask you to read that word out and you're going to read it Kayan Hakon. Ka Yun Ha Kon, right? Which is absolutely wrong. Right? Gayahago. The end result doesn't sound much like the, the written form. So there could be any number of reasons why the linguistic evidence is wrong. The archaeological evidence could also be wrong. Archaeologists look at material culture and try and define a, a culture based on that, right? This only really works in broad strokes, okay? So you got the, the Clovis culture from people who made spear points in a certain way, right? Now, is that a culture as we would know it? No. Probably dozens of different cultures, largely unrelated, made their spear points in the same way. Right? Over in Europe, you got the beaker culture from people who made beakers, right? It's like saying today, we, well, we got the, the iPhone culture, right? Lots of different cultures use iPhones because they're useful. Right? Lots of people made beakers because they're useful. Lots of people made Clovis points because they're useful. So on and so forth. Terms like this, the archaeology and the terms like this are useful for distinguishing larger groups, right? such as the beaker culture, different phases of prehistory. Right? Talking about groups about which we know basically nothing. Okay, beaker culture. They're distinct from these other people who didn't make beakers, this, that, and the other. This kind of archaeology, however, is not useful in distinguishing culture as we understand it. You go through a, a Huron village and you find a pot that's decorated in the Mohawk style. What does that mean? Does it mean that they're the same culture? Or does it mean that they traded pots once? Somebody came on a diplomatic mission and said, Hey, that's a nice pot. I'll give you three beaver skins for it. Oh, yeah, sure thing. Or does it mean that Two people came up with the same design. Simple geometric patterns, it, there's bound to be some overlap. Or let's say, for example, you dig up a pot that doesn't fit into any kind of known style. Is this because it was from a different culture? Or is it because somebody made a mistake and decided to just run with it? Okay, this pot doesn't work out. It's not going to be a Type 25A pot. So I'm just going to 
free jazz it and make whatever happens. Archaeology is bad at distinguishing this sort of thing, right? particularly when the cultures are related. Now, the final issue is that the image of the Laurentians is based on an extremely small sample size. So Cartier, he went to two villages, and that's all the information we have on them. Now, supposedly these people, they lived all around the St. Lawrence. They supposedly had one of the largest territories of any group in the northeastern woodlands. And Cartier went to two villages. So we can, we can compare this to, let's say, the modern, a hypothetical. You're trying to do a study of um, cultural identity among First Nations communities. So you go to Six Nations, and you go to Tyendinaga, and you find that well, about three quarters of all people are Mohawks, and then the remaining quarter is other members of the Six Nations. And you just missed everybody else. Your sample size is too small. right? You go into the ocean, you take a bucket full, and oh, there's no fish in this bucket, therefore there's no fish in the ocean. right? Cartier's sample size is too small. What does that mean? It means that any generalizations about the Laurentians are tenuous at best. It could be that... Cartier went to two villages, and all the rest of the territory along the St. Lawrence was more or less the same. It could be that Cartier went to two villages, and these were the only two villages. All the rest of the territory belonged to someone else, right? Now, archaeology sort of supports this, right? They found different subsistence models among different sites along the St. Lawrence. So southern sites had more agriculture, and sites closer to the ocean, less agriculture, more fishing so on and so forth. Did they have different subsistence models because they were different cultures? Or did they have different subsistence models because that was what's practical, right? Newfoundland and Ontario, different economic models, but they're still part of the same nation. Even when you think you've got some definitive little point, right, it, it falls apart because you don't have any evidence. So we could try and get some other evidence, bring some other evidence in. Well, what else do we have? Well, we got the oral tradition. Six Nations oral tradition holds that the St. Lawrence Iroquoians were us. That's what Six Nations tradition says. They were us. Right? Now, as evidence, there's a, a wampum belt, which I was not able to find images of, which depicts three towers. Now, two of the towers are thick and tall. And one of the towers is smaller and thinner. And the story that goes along with that belt is that once upon a time there was a white guy, and he was sick, and we gave him medicine and nursed him back to health. Two strong pillars supporting the weaker pillar. And that seems to tie into Cartier's story. But does it? It could be that that story applies to Cartier. It could also be that it applies to some random Dutchman who history has forgotten. And we've just shifted the name around because Cartier is more memorable than Johnny Dutchman. It could also be that the story itself is just an example of pan-Indianism. We heard that this happened to Johnny so-and-so down the road, and Johnny so-and-so is not that different from us, so we're just going to claim it, right? So again, we've got some more information, but it doesn't really tell us anything. Right? Now, what about other oral traditions? I was looking into this, and I found the Mi'kmaq oral tradition. Their oral tradition is that the St. Lawrence Iroquoians, they were Mohawks. Now, the Mi'kmaq story is that during the 1500s, after Cartier left, the Mi'kmaq came down and drove the Mohawks out of the northern part of their territory, right? And they say that the St. Lawrence Iroquois were Mohawks and we drove them out. That would sound like pretty good evidence, but again, there's reasons to doubt it. It could be a linguistic issue again. One trend is to not necessarily refer to your enemies by their correct nomenclature. I was doing some reading on Ojibwe history recently. Their word for Mohawks is um, not away. Now, this is also their word for Iroquois, and it's also their word for Huron. These are all Iroquoian people, therefore they are all Nottaway. Maybe the Mi'kmaq story, maybe when they say, oh, we drove the Mohawks out, right, what they mean is we drove those Iroquoian-speaking people out. Maybe the story has also been changed, because it sounds a heck of a lot cooler to say, yeah, we went down there and we beat up the Mohawks, rather than saying, yeah, we went down there and annihilated this small group which has been lost to history. Again, you get more information and none of it goes anywhere. So I suppose I should give like my view. My opinion is that the St. Lawrence Iroquoians were probably a lot of different people. 
some of them Mohawk, some Oneida, some Hurons, some Algonquins, some Innu, some Mi'kmaq, so on and so forth down the line. And maybe some of them were an Iroquoian-speaking people who have been lost to time. I hope you found this interesting.